welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hey everyone, I am super excited to tell you about today's podcast with Dr. Angela Hebner. I called her a triple threat therapist. She's a writer, she's a speaker, and she's a therapist. And she was a professor at Virginia Tech. And um, I didn't know her. I love doing podcasts with people I don't know. Um, and um, she, I didn't know her. And she's really, really smart. And she's really warm. And I found that these are two attributes that I really admire. So I entitled this podcast, The Why Behind Our Weird Questions. Because in IFS, we have some of these really weird questions that we ask of our parts and um, we ask our clients when they're doing this work. Um, And so the first probably 40 minutes, we sort of, you know, we chit chat and we talk about um, lots of things, Um, but we, we mainly talk about these whys, the why behind all the weird questions. As I was editing this, I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I would have asked her more. Um, I just wanted so much more. So about the 40 minute mark, we shift into um, her experience with life force yoga and the idea of breathing to shift emotion, which is super interesting. But that was my first thought was I just want more. So what I did was I included a bunch of links in the show notes. So I included the link to... Angela's website, but then I also included a link to Life Force Yoga, and I included a link um, to Dr. Dan Siegel's site, and specifically um, his book on interpersonal neurobiology. I also included a link to Bruce Ecker's Memory Reconciliation. So we talk about these things. We don't talk about them in detail, but we just touch on them. And I thought this this was the thing I walked away with is I just want more. So I included those links. Obviously, you can Google and find out lots of other information, but those links are there. One thing that I loved that Angela talks about is she talks about our ability to focus is our superpower. And she explains in a way that I promise makes sense the quantum physics behind this important question. The question is where we say, um, can you focus on that part or you focus on where you feel that in your body? Um, And so she explains why we ask that question. And then she also explains what's happening in our brains and our bodies when we retrieve an exile. And it's fascinating. It's just really, really fascinating. Um, I hope you, I hope you like it as much as I did. Um, we talk about memory, we talk about the brain and we talk about longing and spirituality. It's really, really good. I hope you guys like it, um, as much as I did. And I liked talking to her. It's one of those ones that after I edited it, I was like, I'm going to listen to it again because it's really, really good. So I hope everyone's doing well. Um, I'd love to, to hear from you. You can connect with me um, with feedback, ideas, or questions, or just drop a note and say hi at the One Inside Facebook page or on Instagram at IFS Tammy. Okay, enjoy this one. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to meet you. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited too. Yeah. I'm at home and I had to, I had all the windows open and the doors open wow. and then someone started doing their, their grass. Oh. <laughs> I was like, you can't Never. record a podcast with someone. <laughs> That's right. It's pouring here. It's been, I'm in Virginia. It's just been pouring, oh. which is a bummer because I'm ready for some sun. Yes. So I'm, it is actually going to be 80 today. It's been like 50. Like, so we're just having oh, wow. this like random warm day. Like two days ago, I was in a sweater and we had our heat on. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like the end of May. And yeah. So today I'm like, I'm going to take full advantage. Yeah. And yeah, I'm wearing like a tank top and shorts. Tomorrow I'll be back in a sweater. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know. I was like, I think we have an old pool. I'm going to get out my pool. <laughs> and my cool. husband was like, you know, it's going to be 60 tomorrow. I was like, Shut I, don't care. I, know. Right. I don't care. Get me out of the house. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. So are you in Northern Virginia? I'm in Northern Virginia. I live in Alexandria, but my practice is in Falls Church. Okay. 
Yeah. I'm from oh, Maryland okay. originally. Oh, okay. Where in yeah. Maryland? Around the Annapolis area. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty. It's really pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a lot. So I live in New Hampshire now and it's mm-hmm. a lot like Maryland where, but it's um, like the Maryland has like the ocean and the mountains. It's like kind of four, it was like kind of four hours to the ocean, four hours to the mountains. Mm-hmm. But here it's like 20 minutes to the ocean, 20 minutes to the mountains. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Are you from there, from Virginia? No, I actually grew up in Nebraska, um, but moved around after college a bit and then have been in, have been here almost, well, 20 years at this point, 21 years. So this is home. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Isn't it weird when you've lived somewhere longer than you lived at home? Yeah, exactly. I know, it's exactly. So weird. Yeah. Um, so if you were to look out a window, it's raining, mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah. It is. It is raining. I'm sorry. It is raining. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so just so you know, if I look out my window, it's just bright, sunny, blue sky. Jealous. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I was thinking the other day, I was like, this is why we live here. Like from May until probably yeah. October is like why we live here. And then it's awful. And you're like, why do we live here? And then you remember. I know. I yeah. know. Yeah. So um, I'm super excited to talk to you today. You're going to be able to tell us why we ask the weird questions. <laughs> that we, so all day yesterday, I was like, what kind of, <laughs> let me think of all the weird questions we ask yeah. in IFS. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess why don't you start by telling me about the class that you used to teach? So you used to teach this class. So why don't we start by you telling me about interpersonal neurobiology, Mm -hmm. what that is? Yeah. Well, so interpersonal neurobiology was, um, is a, a, a term coined by Dan Siegel back in the late 90s. Um, and it was really his theory of how our functioning depends on the connection between mind, body, and relationships which I think is how it works. So that, that's, it's been around now almost 20 years um, and it's got a lot of traction. So honestly, I got interested in it because I felt like I needed an explanation to justify some of the things I was thinking about or kind of the things that were lighting me up in terms of therapy that at, at the time IFS wasn't empirically validated. Mm, yeah. Um, and I was a professor, a tenured professor at Virginia Tech for 17 years. Um, and I wanted to teach IFS, but it was Virginia Tech. And it's not like we couldn't, but I also wanted to be able to, to talk about what the um, theorized mechanisms of change were, right, that this model brings about. Mm-hmm. And for me, interpersonal neurobiology really... Um, explained that. And it also gave the students a great underpinning for all the other models they were learning. Mm. But selfishly, that's, that's really why I wanted to do it because I felt like IFS is such a great model. And part of what I like about it is it incorporates potentially the spiritual side of things. But I live in a, a spiritual and an empirically based sort of place. So I was trying to find a way Right, to, to, to justify, to balance, to, I don't know how to say that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that worked, and the students loved it. Mm. Yeah. And then did your, did your colleagues know that's what you were doing, or how did they respond to that? They were fantastic. Um, it, my program was the Marriage and Family Therapy um, Master's Degree Program in Northern Virginia, and actually my colleagues and I went through the Level 1 training together. So I had, I mean, that department, um, ridiculously progressive, really open-minded. One of, one of my colleagues um, taught, Eric McCollum taught um, meditation as a class, as a standard class. Wow. Um, highly, highly sought after, you know, really, really great stuff. So Wow. Yeah, I didn't get any any blowback there. How did you guys do the level one training together? That's so we, interesting. Yeah, we, um, okay, so this is a good story. So I really wanted to take the level one training, and this was back in, I, we ended up taking it in 2009. So before that, um, I wanted to take it, but it wasn't being offered in the B, uh, DC metro area um, because it was just too expensive to get training space. Hmm. Um, and so, because I really wanted it, I, I decided I would see if we could host it at our center. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So, so we ended up hosting it in our building um, so we could make it much less expensive for them. And then that we secured some spaces for ourselves as kind of a um, mm-hmm. swap. Yep. So, and that really started, not, that started uh, the footprint of IFS in Northern Virginia and the well, DC so area. That's yeah. awesome because it's like, it, you can see that as it's, 
was like in Chicago. And then you can mm-hmm. see these like pockets of where right. it is, right? There's like a yeah. pocket in California and there, there must be a pocket. I know there's a pocket mm-hmm. like in DC. So it's so interesting. Yeah. So yeah. that's when it started and it was just out of necessity, right? I went the training awesome. and, and I talked to, I talked to them. They're like, it's just too expensive. We can't offer it there. So, wow. Yeah. So and sweet. you have parts that are like, I'm going to make this work. Let's that's figure right. It out. <laughs> that's right. That's right. How did you first hear about IFS? Another colleague um, who was a former student and then she was a supervisor for us, uh, clinical director, went off to be a professor at um, uh, CSU, uh, Jenny, uh, Jenny Matheson, Jennifer Matheson, came back and was doing a little uh, discussion about it, did a little teaching on it, um, and it just spoke to me. It lit me up. It really... Mm. Um, some, I don't, it just, it felt right. I'd studied all of these different models and could teach all of these different models and, yeah. um, was proficient in all of them, but none of them really fit me. And I kept, I was looking for that, you know, what's the one that can light me up. And this was it. And I just knew it was, it's funny. I just knew. I wonder if that is part of that spiritual draw to it, right? That it's not just yeah. like a head, like, yeah, this, this thing makes sense. But is there an explanation of what, why that is, right? Why we like have this, like, wow, my mm. heart just feels so pulled in this direction. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I think it's from a spiritual side. I think it's that, that longing and the way, the way I think about it is we, we can't long for something we didn't experience at one point or another. Right. So, so the way I think about it is I'm longing to be reconnected for me, that source, yeah. right. Where I was before I came into this world. Right. And I think that's, I think that that is housed in our heart. And in fact, mm-hmm. many of the wisdom traditions talk about the heart as the eye of seeing. Mm-hmm. And so it's this portal. I think that, that the longing that. comes from, yeah. and then I love the word remember like coming back into membership of where we came from. Isn't that great? That's amazing. I'm like yeah. stunned. I've never heard that before. That that's for me, that's the oh, spiritual man. pull. And it, it like, I just feel my whole chest opening up mm-hmm. and, and calmer, all of those C's, all of those C words, right. When, yeah. when I'm in that space and yeah, that's, that's my theory. That's my hypothesis of, I think of why I think we long. Yeah, it's a good yeah. it's a good theory. Yeah. And we all have it. I think no matter what our childhoods yeah. are, it doesn't mean that we've had to have a horrible mm-hmm. childhood. Right. No matter what, we all have this longing. I think that's Yeah. Yeah. And why can't psychotherapy answer that? Like if we're trying to help people, mm-hmm. why can't we bring like yeah. why does it have to be so separate? Like we have to go to right. like religion or faith traditions or Right. People are all finding it anywhere. And right. we were talking about this um, in New Hampshire, you know, people, I feel like people don't go to church up in New Hampshire because they, they go outside, they yeah. hike, they, they're all, so I feel like they're finding that longing yeah. in all this outdoor, outdoor stuff. Like there's so right. much outdoor stuff up here yeah. and it's like, that's what's answering. Yeah. Yeah. So why can't we, we need to answer that in therapy. Well, and I, and I think we do like when, when I, you know, talk about the way I do therapy, even on my website, I talk about it's the art and science of psychotherapy. And to me, that's bringing together spiritual creativity, all, all of that stuff and the science. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, well, for my clients, I'll see what resonates for them right? In terms of trying to bring in that as a resource, whether it is spirituality or religion or it's science, right? So some of them, quantum physics works. And so I can use this language to explain to them why I'm asking these crazy questions that I have assessed. And then when I'm able to describe that, their protective intellectual parts take a seat and go, okay, yeah, I was just, yeah, exactly. I was just thinking that it's like parts of us, it's like if we can answer that um, right. Okay. So I, this has happened to me before where I can, I end up sort of intellectually explaining the model right. to a client and then I can see their parts settle and then we yeah. can do some experiential work. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. And I think frankly, that's how I was because mm-hmm. in, in my growing up, um, part of my experience was, uh, you've got to be able to defend what you're saying and you know, oh, that's oh, okay. You know, it's like, okay. And 
you know, that kind of, so, so I got pretty good at, um, out of necessity being able to at least be sure, sure of, of what my position was. Mm. And so I think that that kind of flowed into this. And now I've, I've done enough work that I can pull them together un, unapologetically. <laughs> Isn't that interesting too, that it's like you're, because of your childhood, it's almost like this parts of you are like, okay, well, I'm going to prove it. And so I'm right. going to go and I'm going to get this higher education. I'm going to be this professor exactly. and I'm going to be this big deal <laughs> to help the, then that's, yeah, to help yeah. those parts that have had to defend yourself for so much. And so that long. knew all along, right? That knew even then the seeking part of me knew, but she wasn't understood. Yeah. Right. But I, I think that's how it has to work sometimes, right? That's our, that's our path. Yeah. 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 Right. Cause I think if there are parts of me, if there had not been parts of me that felt unseen, mm-hmm. I don't know that I would have, have gone to school. I don't know that I would have been here in this exactly. moment. Same, same. So, so I'm, I'm, it's an acceptance of that was my path. Cause that was my path. Yeah. Not that there's not been a lot of work around that. <laughs> right, <laughs> but, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah and it's, it is interesting that it's like right on the other side of it, you can see that like when you're out of it, you can look yeah. back and like, okay, yeah. yeah. Or even thinking of an IFS, if my protectors relax and I'm with an exile, I can really see, oh, like when I yeah. hear the secret story, I'm like, oh, yeah. this makes so much sense. Yep, exactly. Let's talk about what's happening in the brain yeah. when we do IFS. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. So what I, when I talk about what's happening in the brain with IFS, I'm really pulling from Bruce Ecker's reconsolidation theory or memory reconsolidation um, as, a, as a change mechanism, right? And so... So when I'm talking to therapists that are learning IFS um, and they say, what's happening? When we're asking somebody, or a client to focus on a particular, you know, where do you find this part in or around your body? That first crazy question. Yeah. Um, we're really focusing our attention and we're locating um, a particular sensation, neural network pattern. We're connecting to something more concrete in the body. Okay. Or in the mind. So it's giving us a point of focus. And we know that focus is our superpower. What we focus on changes things, right? What, what fires together wires together. And the stuff that fires together is what we're paying attention to. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. And okay. I, I'm just, I'm like having this weird moment right now because I'm like, okay. my husband just told me something like I was, I was going to my office yesterday and I was in like getting in my car and he said something about, he, he made, he quoted something about focus. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he was, I was like, and he said it was Tony. He's like, Oh, that's Tony Robbins. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, I have to find out what he said, that's but funny. he said something about, but that idea of like what we yeah. focus on is what we're going to develop or, and he said it in right. a lovely way. And I was like, Oh, that's good. And he was like, Oh, it's Tony Robbins. <laughs> well, yeah. And, 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 you know, Tony's no dummy. He picks up the neuroscience stuff and plops it right in. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that makes so much sense. I love that. Right. Yeah. The focus and that, that focus as actually being, um, I call it a superpower comes from, from, um, experiments in quantum physics. When they look at a photon can be a wave or a particle and there's a classic split stream screen experiment. Um, and so when, when scientists were measuring, it, it turned into a particle when it was just allowed to be free. Like no, nobody's measuring, nobody's paying attention. It was a wave. Wow. And so if there's something about focusing your attention that wow. makes it a particle. Interesting. Well, yeah. and right. So if we ask that first crazy question, mm-hmm. oftentimes, um, well, that's what, that's what keeps clients from sort of just talking all over the place. That's and right. like, okay, so right. can we focus on that? Yep. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's the why behind the first crazy question. Otherwise, they're going to continue being a mm-hmm. wave, mm-hmm. right? The wave that's will continue. Right. Yeah. And then we ask, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yep. love that. Yeah. So then, then the how do you feel toward it question, right, is getting more focus, essentially. How do you feel toward it? The, the interesting brain thing to me that I think is happening, and, and um, Dick and Frank and I have talked about this, this, this notion of when I'm focusing on the part, 
and I'm hearing the story, particularly around the exile. So now I'm focused on the part. When there's enough emotion, so emotion, the chemical signatures of emotion, make that neural network of implicit memory malleable. And this is part of reconsolidation theory. So we know that many of the experiences we have when we're growing up, when they have a high emotional balance, so when they're, there's a lot of emotion behind them, our brain and memory codes them really quickly. Right? Those are the ones that stick, and they go, we call it emotional learning through the limbic system, and that gets in implicit memory wow. or outside of conscious awareness. Wow. Right, which is sometimes great um, yeah. and sometimes not so great, right? So, so in the work that we do with our exiles, we're really focusing our attention in a way that we can make that unconscious procedural implicit memory conscious. Like I'll say to my clients, we're putting it on the desktop of your mind so that we can tinker with it. Wow. Right? So it's wow. the emotion. We need the emotion, right? Can you feel a little hit? Can, and we see our clients having an emotional, it can't, so that can't be a logical right. exercise. It's got to be an emotional connection. Right. That opens that neural network for change or updating. So now it's open. And again, this is reconsolidation theory. Now we're witnessing, and that's part of the emotion, then we do an update. And the update, right, well, can you let it know how old you are now? Can you let it know, you know, does it want to leave that time and place and come to present? All of those things that we do, or even the redo, right? Do you want to go back and let it have a different experience? What did it need? Yeah. All of those crazy things we ask or say are introducing um, what Bruce Ecker would call a juxtaposition. So some, uh, an experience that contradicts what was initially in that implicit learned memory, hmm. that emotional memory. And we're not saying this one's wrong and this one's right. We're just holding up two contradictory things for the brain to make sense of. Wow. Isn't that cool? So if we, I think that you just said, you said this, but I, I think mm -hmm. I want to hear it again. Mm -hmm. If we, if I just tell you about, oh, I remember a time in first grade where um, I got a B on a, on my drawing with a girl next to me named Denise. She got an A plus plus and I was really upset. True story. And I tell you about this. Yes, yes, I tell yes. you about this story and I'm telling it to you from my head and I, in right. my memory, I do have the memory of this, mm -hmm. um, a vague memory of this. Mm -hmm. And so how would that be different than going to my, so then I have a prob probably I have a protector that's worked really hard to make sure I get A plus plus pluses all the time and right. never ever get a B. Um, and then I have this sort of little first grader exile mm -hmm. that's feeling the shame mm -hmm. of that moment. Mm -hmm. um, how, how is that different? So when my, my thought is when you're telling me about it, it's coming from a protector. The narrator, the protector is sanitizing the story. So I can tell you about it, but there's no, there's no emotion with it. It's, it's just a narrative. Yeah, yeah. And that's the difference. When I'm there, I'm not in the file that needs to be updated. I'm not in the file cabinet. That's not, I'm changing language a little bit, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not, in, I'm not in the file. Yeah. So then no transformation is going to happen. I could tell you the story and we can kind of laugh about it. And then I actually don't feel a ton of shame about it, but I actually, it's funny, even it telling it to you that way mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then telling it to you protector and exile way and the shame, I actually mm -hmm. felt a little bit different. Like I felt a little bit okay. funny feeling in my belly, even okay. as I told you it in a different mm -hmm. way. Yeah. I think when we tell it from, from the protector way, we're strengthening the protectors. Okay. Right. They're getting reinforced for, yeah, see, I can talk about this. No big deal. I don't have to feel this. I can, as long as I keep myself separated from this exile, I keep it exiled. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so much sense because then I'm just telling it and then, right. right so then more I tell it, it's actually separating from the exile even more. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. And right. then, right. So then if I'm not going into the file or taking it out of my body and putting mm -hmm. it on the table to look at and tinker mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. and then update it, then no change really is going to happen. That's right. That's my protector right. is still going to be working hard to make mm -hmm. sure I get A plus pluses mm -hmm. and my little part is still going to feel shame. That's right. About not We're just going to get plus better plus. At, at cutting ourselves off from it. <laughs> yeah. So sort of like sometimes in my that head. That works great, I think. <laughs> right. Well, it can, right? Okay. <laughs> sometimes I see it as like I'm taking my, my little girl and putting her right in front of me and saying, okay, Aww. tell me, you know, like, okay, darling, tell me. 
I'm here. I yeah. Love that. Yeah. Instead so, of a file, you know. <laughs> yes, the file. Right. You go. That's, a, that's right. definitely one of my managers. You go in this file. You go in right. this file. Let's shut the yeah. door. Yeah. Yeah. I saw this. Um, if people don't know, there is a Facebook page. IFS Parts Art, I think, is what it's called. It's pretty new. And someone posted a picture of their uh, a drawing they did of like themselves in this like polka dot dress mm. and their sweet tooth little girl part that was like sitting on her shoulder oh. and like having a lollipop and I just felt so much love for that sweet tooth little mm. girl and I thought wow I don't feel love for my sweet tooth little girl at all she like mm, yeah right I don't know why I just told you that but yeah sort of that idea yeah. of What's feeling that, that image yeah yeah yeah, that image actually. I wonder if that also hap- creates something different in the in the body too. When we have an image, like I wonder, what what does that do versus like if I tell you about my first grader versus that if I like I have an image of her, like I can see her sitting at that desk. That's probably more of putting her out in front of me. It, it's any way that you can vivify the experience, right? So maybe I'm feeling the feelings, maybe I'm smelling the smells, hearing the sounds, and maybe I'm seeing it. But I think that you know, sort of depends on your, your learning channel and all of that kind of stuff too. Because yeah, yeah, some people yeah. don't have images, have um, that, but they yeah. still have a pretty powerful experience. Yeah, um, so Whatever, it. yeah, that vivifying through the senses. Right, right. The sense of what it was like in that sitting at that desk. Yeah. Yeah. From a sensory experience, not a logical experience. Yeah. Right, right. And so then we can take it out and we can update it. And then something happens. Do you feel like something shifts in our body then? Or like something actually transforms in our body when we do that work? I believe so. um, Because when we do that reconsolidation, so now I've introduced this thing and the, we're able to let go of, this is the, you know, can you, are you ready to release that? Are you ready to clear that out? Um, We're actually letting go of the thing, that first experience, that first memory that that set up all of our strategies, all of our protectors. And once they don't have to protect this, right? And this is exactly what we do in the model. um, When that, the thing, the learning, the, the emotional memory isn't there, the rest of the system doesn't need to do that. Yeah. So, so it changes, right? And you, you see this in other therapies too, like EMDR or, you know, an IFS that, oh, it's just gone. Yeah. 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 I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, right. So if it's, if I take it out, if I take it out and I put it on the table and I tinker with it Mm -hmm. and then I put it back in, I'm putting it back in differently. Right. Right. It's similar to um, much of what we know about memory now, just normative memory research talks about every time you remember something, it reconstitutes. So, so there's not like a place in your brain where there's a memory. It's more like a hologram and it pulls together lots of different pieces. Every time it comes up, we are inadvertently adding, updating it. Unless it's in trauma, like unless it's a trauma memory that's stuck in time, right? That's different with our exiles, but right. normal memory, we're updating as we go. Right. So right. every time you pull it up, you add, then it goes back down and then it comes up, right? right. Like, like uh, windows, you know, like are you working on 95 or are you working on <laughs> windows <laughs> 2020? Yeah. Um, is that why, so there's a part of me that actually began to feel a little bit scared. Like, wow, we really can't trust our memory. Have you ever done this before we go to a restaurant and you were like, these are the best scallops I've ever had in my yeah. life. Yeah. They were huge and amazing. And then you go back six months later and you're like, these don't even, right. like my memory of these scallops does not match what right. these scallops were like. Right. I think it just shows how, um, yeah, how unreliable it is, but it depends on what purpose it's for, right? Mm-hmm. Um, my long time ago when I was in undergraduate school, um, I was in a class where the first day, it was a psychology class, and the first day of class, the professor said, write down what you did last night. And so all of us wrote it down on, a, on an index card, and she kept them until the end of the semester. And then she said, okay, I want you to tell me what you did the night before class started. And so we wrote it down again, and then she handed us back the card. Um, none of them were right. None of them. Right, you kind of made a logical guess. Well, it was a Sunday night, so I must have been. But so wow. that, that was my, wow, this is tricky stuff. <laughs> Um, did you, did you listen to, um, 
um, shoot, what was that podcast? Serial? Did you listen to Serial, that podcast? Oh, like huge. yes, yes. Yeah. And I remember she said that, that like, you know, they're doing all these interviews of where were you when this happened? Mm-hmm. Where were you this happened? Mm-hmm. That like, if you ask the average person, they don't know where they were last Tuesday. Right. And so then you ask these other people and like, oh yeah, last Tuesday I was with Joe and we went and did this. Mm-hmm. And it's like the average person doesn't remember that they were with Joe and they went and got pizza. Right. And right. I thought that, I just remember that, I thought that was fascinating. Well, and it's back to our brain is going to code the stuff that pings, right? That has a higher emotional balance. We can't code everything. So our brain's selective about right. that. So if it was a really great experience or a really bad experience, we, we pay more attention. Wow. Right? If I said, how was your cup of coffee? It was a cup of coffee. It was fine. Or that yeah. was the best cup of coffee. Or that was, oh my God, it was, right? Usually I had coffee. <laughs> that makes okay that makes so much sense and I just want to like repeat yeah, that again because sure. I'm like this is so interesting so that idea that my brain can't ping everything so it's right. going to ping the stuff that's important or that needs a little more attention or needs remembering I guess for survival way. right for survival yeah. I move toward it or I move away from it I love that well yeah. and then is that partly why we remember some negative things more Absolutely. Because I need to remember, I need to remember that if I eat from that tree, that's got poisonous exactly. stuff. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And that's the whole why we need. Um, uh, they talk about Teflon for the for the bad, or Teflon for the good, and Velcro for the bad. Rick Hansen's work. That's why, because Mother Nature. I always say to my clients, Mother Nature doesn't care if you're happy; she just wants you to be alive. <laughs> like she's kind of she's kind of a bee like that. She just wants you to be. <laughs> she just wants you to be alive. Right. So then I'm going to remember the really good stuff. This comes up with books too. Like I remember yeah. if I really liked a book and I remember if I really didn't like a book and some books that are in the middle, I don't even remember reading. Exactly. Exactly. I don't even remember if I read that book. Right. Right. Because we can't, we can't code everything. So our brain learns to prioritize based on early experiences, right? Which gets us into all of these yeah. patterns that work or don't work for us that end up people coming to therapy for the ones that aren't working. Do you feel like when we go into our exiles that, like sometimes I have actual mem- like I'm like, okay, I remember this experience. Like I might not remember it right now, but when mm-hmm. I'm with my exile and the exile's telling me the story, I'm yeah. like, oh yeah, this was an experience. But sometimes it's not, it's not a memory or a thing that I, that I actually had. Like I remember mm-hmm. like recently I was like, this didn't actually happen. But it was like this, and I don't know if it was like a sense of it, or maybe Mm -hmm. if it was like a pattern Mm -hmm. that I felt from my mom or or something like that, but it was like, there wasn't something that actually happened. So I guess, I guess my question is, do sometimes exiles just hold like sense experiences? Okay. And not actual like, yes, on this, this event happened. Right. Yes. Because um, what's going to get what's going to stay with that exile is their perception, their belief of what happened at the time. It doesn't mean it was true, but if that was what they believed, that goes, that's truth for them, Yeah, you know, with the small T, but yeah. So if I, you know, if I believed it was my fault, even though it wasn't, that's truth for me. That's the memory that's going to get in there for me. Right. So that's what, I mean, I say to clients, it doesn't, you know, when they're going into exile work, well, what if, what if I'm remembering stuff that's not true? Yeah. And I say, it doesn't matter because it was, unless we're pressing charges, which, you know, that's a whole nother, um, right. but it, it, for our work right here, right now, right. it was true for that little one. That was, that was their belief, their record. It, so it doesn't matter. We mm-hmm. still need to heal that. We can't mm-hmm. argue with them about whether or not that was their experience. That's not helpful. So, yeah, but Mm -hmm. have you had clients that were like, no, I need to know, like Mm -hmm. I have a sense that I was abused and Mm -hmm. I look at my behavior Mm -hmm. and I think, okay, I'm, people have said you must've been abused because and I need to know whether Mm -hmm. I was or wasn't because I feel like if I wasn't, then I'm crazy. Right. So I work with the part that, that needs to know. Okay. Right. What are you afraid would happen if you didn't know? What would be like if you did? Um, Why is that so important to that part? Yeah, that's good. Right? And that, that reveals this whole constellation of, am I crazy? Am I not crazy? Do I have to justify to other people? Are they going to blow yeah, back? Right. And then I'll right. say, it's just you have, your system has to integrate it. And it's up to you whether or not you share that with anybody else, mm. but you know what's true for you. And that's, mm. that helps you become integrated, congruent, all of those good things. Yeah. Okay. About the crazy questions we ask, mm-hmm. is there something mm-hmm. that happens in our brain when we ask the, 
um, what are you afraid would happen if, if, if you didn't do that? Or what are you afraid mm -hmm. would happen? Is that, we know that, that if you say, okay, what are you afraid? Like, so my first grade or protector, like, what are you afraid would happen if you didn't work so hard to get eight pluses? Mm -hmm. And then that leads me that sort of chaining to, you know, I would be a bad girl or mm -hmm. I would be bad. Mm -hmm. Um, is there something that happens in the brain with that question? Because that's such a powerful question. I, I think it gets us back to what's the, what's the belief, right? Okay. What's the belief about self that, that influences my view of self and my view of other, mm. right? That gets at that initial schema, template, whatever word you want to use, okay. that exile story, which colors then what information I'm going to take in as I go out into the world. If I believe I'm bad, I'm going to interpret the way other people interact with me from a particular lens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it sort of sets, sets it initially. And then I it, the, what I think it changes in the brain to, to answer that it changes what information we allow into our system. That makes so much sense, right? If I can't right? ping on to everything, then if right. I believe I'm bad, I'm going to ping on to things that, that prove that exactly. I collect evidence from my CBT days, right? I exactly. collect evidence right? to, the, to, uh, reinforce Confirm my, my badness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. So, right. so it's actually, I mean, to me, that's, it's a brilliant strategy when it's working well, a brilliant, you know, uh, way mother nature's configured us yeah. until it's not. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it's so protective, right? It's just everything right. you think of is like, wow, that is so protective. Whether it's like I eat from the, the tree with the good berries or the yeah. tree with the poisonous berries, like it's so protective. It's, it's amazing. Well, and that's what I love so much about the model is that it's everything makes sense when you understand the context within which it was formed or what it's trying to do. And I believe that wholeheartedly. And, and I think that really changes everything. Yeah. In, in therapy with in, in connection to our parts. It does change everything when you're like, my critic is such a jerk <laughs> right. and is so mean to me and ruins yeah. my day and he's such a bully. And then when we realize that that critic is actually just trying to help us and yeah, what a difference that makes. Yeah. And what a difference it makes in our day-to-day -day life. That's why, yeah. I, yeah, I, absolutely. One of the other things I love about this model is it. The so, someone leaves my office and they feel different immediately. Yeah. Like they feel they've done work. Like mm -hmm. if they've done work, then they immediately feel feel different. Right. Right. And it's it's in, when I when I'm able to walk my clients through that, and because of where I live, I get a lot of engineers. You know, I get a lot of computer and all those kinds of brainy people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they then they calm down. Yeah, I love that. Well, and yeah. you're and think I love that too. That it's like because of your experience, you needed to know all the brainy stuff, yeah. and then once you knew that and did some work, your parts were allowed to open up to all that um, spiritual aspect of the model. Yes. But yeah. then then you become the perfect therapist for people that are like you and that yeah. need both. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that. so. I think, yeah, I think so. It sounds like it. <laughs> That's yeah. normal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you don't teach anymore though, right? You just, do you just have a private practice now? I, I have a private practice now. I am doing, um, I am teaching some different places, just like, you know, two day workshops here and there. Um, yes. I've been doing that with like an intro to IFS, uh, have done it here in Northern Virginia, have, have done it in some other places as well. Now with yeah. COVID, not so much, but yeah. So tell me about that. That was the other thing I yeah. want to talk about are these yeah. two day workshops. Cause I think yeah. so many people, I think a lot of people that listen to this podcast, we've mm -hmm. got all kinds of, all kinds of people. We've got you know, clients of IFS. Mm -hmm. We've got people that have done level one, two, and three. And then we have people that are just interested in, yeah. in the model and haven't done training. So I love it when we can tell people about any like mm -hmm. non-level trainings where they can yeah. just get more information. So tell me about the two-day trainings. Yeah. Doing. So so the two-day trainings um, that, that I've been offering do an overview of the model. There's a demonstration. Um, they really, they hear the brain piece that I just talked to you about. And the people that I tend to attract are therapists um, seasoned therapists that have heard about IF, IFS and really aren't interested in going through yet a whole nother certification process. Yeah. Um, and I get that. So, so I've done, I've done those to get people interested. And then we've done some ongoing supervision things after that, or oh, consultation great. things to say, okay, you've worked with it for a while. What are you seeing yeah. um, at, at that level? And some, some people then go on to do the, an actual level one. And, and again, some people that they're just past that stage in their career. Yeah. 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 So it's yeah. been really fun. 
That's super fun. Yeah, and I so you, you doing in, in Northern Virginia and then you, were you traveling to do them too? I did. Yeah, I did some in Louisiana um, and uh, did stuff at Cape Cod Institute. Yeah. All right, let's talk about that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you were supposed to do, sad face, yes. supposed to do the life force yoga in IFS. Yeah. Well, so, so, um, are you familiar, you're familiar with Amy Weintraub's life force yoga? Well, is that, is she, I'm a, familiar with life force yoga. Is yes, she the one that, okay. She is the founder. Um, okay. And now Rose Crest has taken on, that on and, and Amy's, you know, kind of doing, doing some more of her own stuff. But okay. yeah, I, so I heard about life force yoga at an IFS conference early on. That's, and it, that's the only thing I know about it is I heard about it at the conference yeah. and I think I did a, like a, uh, not like a workshop, but I did a yoga yeah. class with someone, but I don't remember who it was. Maybe it. it was her. Maybe with Amy. Well, yeah. so so it was another one of those. Okay, I just know I'm supposed to do this. So again, my colleague and I went to Amy's session, um, and I was like, I like this. And he looked at me. He's like, You need to go to that training. And so I went to her level, her teacher training in Tucson, um, back in 2011. And so learned learned her model. And it's really breath to manage mood from a therapist perspective. Like there's a whole you know yoga therapist part of it. That's that's not what I do, but definitely. Pranayama, how to use breath to shift emotion and some movements related to breath. I love um, and that. it was fantastic. And the, um, so it was there in 2011. Um, and then, so here's how Amy and I got together. So then in 2013, um, Frank Anderson and I did a, a day long pre-conference workshop um, at the IFS conference on neuro, interpersonal neurobiology and, and IFS and, and what's happening. And it was so much fun. We had a really great time. Um, and Amy was teaching down the hall and she's like, Oh, Angela, you're at my training. This is so great. And so we started, you know, we started talking again and then she, somebody dropped out of a training here more locally recently than the last couple of years. And she asked if I, if I would come integrate and then we just hit it off. Um, so the, the fun part though, this is kind of funny in it, when I was at teaching at Virginia tech, um, Virginia Tech, if for people that don't know, is a big engineering school, big business school, all of that kind of stuff. So I would be teaching my students um, in one classroom, and next to us would be this group of engineers, and I would have everybody up doing all this crazy breathing and making all of these, you know, ha noises and breathing and getting in there. And people are like, what is going on in there? But my, my students really used it, and we would do that actually in supervision. Before we would start supervision, when they went into the clinic with their clients, I'd help, I would use the, this breath work to get them focused and centered. Um, and so I think what Amy's done is, is amazing because it helps us settle some of the protectors so that we can go in. Mm. That's how I, that's how I, that's how I've used her work. And even like clients online, will do a, will do a breathing exercise for them to, again, settle into the body. Okay. So tell me about that. What mm -hmm. you just said, using the breath to settle protectors so that we can go in, inside. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, so when we talk about um, breath work, I, I connect that to um, fight, flight, right? Sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and polyvagal theory, right? So yeah. we know that if we know that if our exhalation, for example, is longer than our inhalation, right? If I'm blowing air out for longer than I'm taking in, parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and I can relax a little bit. Mm -hmm. My brain will get a little quieter. I can sort of calm and at least get a little bit of space. Um, there's other exercises that she has. One is called bee breathing. Um, and I like to call it control alt delete because you do this, you just shut down all of your senses and you do, it sounds like a bee is in your throat. But when you've done like three breaths like that, it's just this calm. Okay, so if I were, I feel like I've done this before. So yeah. what you do is you shut your eyes and you, it's, yeah. So can you describe yeah. with your, so you, what you're doing right now is you're shutting, you're taking your hands, your hands are on your face. Mm -hmm. You are shutting your eyes. Mm -hmm. You are, are you pinching your nose? So you're going, no. the, the way that I describe it is you're, you're touching all of these um, acupuncture points. Okay. And so I tell my clients, you're walking down your face. Right. So, so pointer it. fingers at your eyebrows, middle fingers, uh, lightly shutting your eyes because you're trying to close off your senses and then uh, ring fingers at the corner of your nose because you got to be able to breathe, but there's okay. an acupuncture point right there and then corner of your mouth. 
And then with your thumbs, you shove in that little piece of cartilage so that you can't hear. And it's like you're in the, it's like you're underwater. Mm. And then you make the sound of a, of a bee tongue on the roof of your mouth and you can really feel mm, that buzzing sound. And when you put that all together, as crazy as it looks, it just settles, control, alt, delete. That's, that's what I like to, that's my word for it. You know, like when everything just shuts down, you're like, ah, at least for a couple of seconds, right? And then it fires back mm-hmm. up. But, and I use a lot of those with clients that, that are really anxious, um, then other breath to help increase the mood. Yeah, that's um, great. I love yeah. that. So everyone needs to pause right now and do that. Yeah. Put your hands, put your fingers <laughs> there. I, and I love how you're doing this sort of like weird thing, but then yeah. you use the control alt delete. Like those are those two sides right. of you, right? It you're like, right. I'm going to do this really weird thing, but then we're going to call it control alt delete, which everyone knows like exactly. it's going to. And it call, it kicks in parasympathetic nervous system. And then it allows for that, that ventral vagal connection. Mm. Right. And when I'm there, I think that's a marker of self energy. Yeah, definitely. When I'm in ventral vagal energy, so. Well, and then you're giving the person the experience, right? So you're like, yes. this, so then this, so then you have this experience for a few seconds and that feels like heaven when you've been right. in fight or flight constantly. It feels that's like, right. oh, to get a pause and to get some yeah. space feels like a gift. Yeah. And, and at least for me with my clients, that gives me a little credibility Right, right off the bat, if I can get them to do this thing where they experientially feel a shift in their body, mm. and it was through their breath, which, which I, I can see whether or not they're doing that internally. I can feel if they're, if they're connected to a part, but yeah. it's, it's less um, observable. Yeah. So then, yeah. then they relax a little bit more and say, okay, she's got me. I love that. Yeah. Um, so you... Just to back up just a second, yeah, you yeah. hadn't had yoga training. It wasn't like you went, like you yeah. had gone, done yoga training and then. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. I do yoga, but I'm certainly not a yoga asana teacher. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that there was, I, did she teach the life force yoga at um, Kripalu? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think yes, there, yes. Okay. Because I think yeah. there was, a, um, if I remember correctly, um, speaking of memory, I have a vague sense that I did something with her at the conference when it was in, or with Life Force Yoga, when it uh-huh. was in um, here, was it in, where was it? Rhode Island. Was Rhode it Rhode Island? Island. Yeah. Yep. And then I remember getting something from, from, from Kapalu and was like, oh, I should do that. Yeah. But then it was like, I couldn't do all the stuff. And right, right, right. I no, she has taught all over the place. And, and now it's Amy Weintraub's yoga because Life Force Yoga is now with, um, uh, Rose Cress. Oh, so they've split, split they've, off. Yeah. Just okay. like, yeah. Um, but, but that was Amy back in the day. Okay. And so, so still teaching different okay. places. Yeah. Okay. So, so anyway, so we got together and went to Cape Cod Institute. Yeah. Last so you've year. done that. So was that the first time you guys That did was that? the first time I had done that. She's done it before. Um, but she invited me and, um, it was fantastic. We had a great time. Oh my gosh. Oh, great time I to be able to do Cape both. Cod. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, and you are such a blessing because you know both, you know, you're able to do both, both and be able to yeah. integrate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's the Cape Cod Institute, which is so Exactly. <laughs> I can't, can't go wrong there. Okay. So we just start with our last question, yes. which is if you weren't doing all the things that you're doing yes. you, and you could do whatever you wanted, mm-hmm. what would you do? I am certain that I would be on tour with Billy Joel as a backup singer. Yes. I think that's what I would be doing. <laughs> that is I would, awesome. I would be in residence at, uh, in New York with them. Yes, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite Billy Joel song? Oh, Scenes from an Italian Restaurant. Favorite nice. song. Nice. Favorite song. Um, <laughs> and do you feel like you would wear, like what would you be wearing? Oh, flowy. Okay. Flowy. Yeah, little Stevie Nicks flowy. Ooh. I don't know how Billy about that but I, I i can see myself being a little flowy, a little flowy. yeah okay yeah <laughs> i love it the, right so it's got the billy joel vibe which is sort right. of chill but then you got the stevie nicks vibe which yeah. is definitely flowy yeah. that sounds great yeah i'm in the back just you know shaking something uh-huh <laughs> i love it and you're doing it now and i'm doing yeah. it we're dancing see? together yeah. it feels good <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right, Angela, this was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. That was great. (laughs) 
Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time. Today's episode was sponsored by Brighter Vision. What's the point of having a beautiful website if it doesn't attract the clients you want to see? As the worldwide leaders of website design for therapists, Brighter Vision sees this issue happen way too often. A nice looking website doesn't equate to a successful website. The truth is, your current website might even be turning off potential clients. That's where Brighter Vision comes in. Brighter Vision's team of website designers will create a website that is centered around attracting and retaining your ideal client so that you can have a nice looking website as well as a successful one. Better yet, Brighter Vision is offering $100 off exclusively for listeners of the One Inside podcast. To take advantage of this offer, simply go to brightervision.com backslash inside. Again, that's brightervision.com backslash inside.